Hello everyone, this is Candid Crack. Today we have Malcolm. How are you, Malcolm? Yeah, fine, thanks. Uh, it's middle of May here in London and still raining and still pretty cold. I'm still wearing my winter coat, which is not good. <laughs> winter coat? That's, is it that cold? Well, it's colder than normal. And when you get this biting wind coming from the east, it can still feel cold. Excellent. But it's uh, still it's still double. It's about 12 degrees today, I think. So. I've, I've been struggling in 32 degrees and 85% humidity. So. <laughs> yeah, in Hong Kong, it's yeah. so the humidity is just through the roof. It's crazy today. Yeah. But anyway, we're not going to talk about the weather today. Uh, Malcolm, um, I actually, before I start, I just before we went live uh, or started recording, you actually explained to me how you met Richard on LinkedIn. I think that's a oh. quite an interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes back about three or four years. And um, basically, uh, I, I used to sort of come, come on my way home from work, go to the pub every Friday. Now, my wife wasn't really into it. So I'd sort of go there with my laptop and start sort of playing around, would you believe, with HTML or JavaScript issues and sort of experimenting until I was basically too drunk to really know what I was doing anymore. Then I would actually go onto LinkedIn because I then had the confidence to start posting stuff. And there was something about tragedy or Shakespeare or something. So I actually answered and um, much to my surprise, someone who I'd never met, Richard, then answered back and started mentioning Kenneth Burke. Now, this for me was really weird because I think Kenneth Burke is totally ultra, totally out there. And, but he was central to when I was doing postgraduate research. I mean, I never wrote my PhD, but it was all centered around Burke's rhetoric. So I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, how, how strange is that? Um, but that was about four years ago. And I, um, so that was the, almost the last I heard of it until um, I started following Drinking Dialogues, for example, in EQ Labs on LinkedIn. Um, but I never, uh, the first time I came was October. So four years, three, four years ago is when I first had a contact with Richard, but it was only rarely we spoke in October. Excellent. Well, well for the listeners and viewers, mm -hmm. just explain who Malcolm K. Wood is. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Now. I'm, you see, I'm not sure. Um, I suppose most people will start talking about the work they do, but I never really have identified with my work because it keeps on changing. So maybe perhaps an anecdote from 30 years is a way of getting into this. I, I was having a bit of a falling out with a friend and he called me a chameleon. Now he was using that as a criticism because he thought I was changeable and unreliable. Uh, I, I of course took it as a compliment because <laughs> I've been into this different role playing for years. And I suppose, in a sense, it goes further. Um, have you ever come across the David Bowie track where there's a lyric that says, um, he's chameleon, comedian, uh, Corinthian, and caricature? Uh, and I always feel as if that's a kind of a sense of um, maybe who I am, different role playing. I mean, the idea of Corinthian with its amateurist, amateurism. <laughs> uh, I suppose also underpins a kind of sense of imposter syndrome I've always had. But there is this different idea of playing masks, you know, playing well, well, I know Richard calls masks, but the idea of playing different roles and almost being defined by your roles. I think the Bowie idea of almost your outer self is a caricature of your inner self uh, are all these kind of like ideas I sort of tend to sort of play around with. What about your, yeah, I, I, was, I, I was gonna go, I was gonna go. There were two interesting lots of responses. So, so which of these masks and roles do you enjoy constructing? So if you reflect back on your life, there's probably gonna be some stories, masks, roles that you mm. sort of felt that you artfully constructed. Can you, can you talk through a few of those? I suppose, um, you see, I can't play a musical instrument, um, which is always really a, a great regret. But I remember once, when I was only about 21, you know, trying to write these kind of angst-ridden post-adolescent poems just, uh, where I used a line saying, I, I tried to play my life like a saxophone. Um, and then I suppose a, a, a few years later on, I was having a talk with um, a, a client and <clears throat> it was one I'd got friendly with, so we were probably in the pub. Uh, and he was saying, you know, you're not like a normal consultant, are you? He says, you know, what is it you do? And I said, well, I do jazz consulting. 
And, and I, I made a bit of a laugh about that. But I suppose the thing is, the more serious aspect is being able to sort of improvise or wing it. So being this, I, this kind of living on my wits. Now that implies confidence. But as I said, when you've got imposter syndrome, it can also be quite terrifying. Um, so I suppose in a sense, that's one kind of role. But I suppose another type as well, and now I'm going to shift my metaphors to cricket. Um, sometimes I can be incredibly diligent. You know, I mean, only a while back, there was something really urgent came up. And it was like, you know, everyone went headless chicken and maybe counterintuitively, I just slowed right down and just went back to following the procedures. So if you think of cricket, you know, I mean, I like to think of myself as like Rich, Viv Richards, who can score a century in 44 balls like he did against England once. Or I can be a Chris Tavaray who sits there for seven hours and scores 60. <laughs> you know, so in a sense, I think the, the winging it role is the one that I perhaps enjoy the most or have, have enjoyed the most. I mean, winging it and imposter syndrome are... Oh. <laughs> are, are quite far away. Um, yeah. so, 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 is there any inner turmoil there that you have to? Deal oh yeah, with? absolutely. And, absolutely. And how do you deal? How do you deal with it? Well, you see, I think the thing is, is um, I use this word semi-detached. Um, it's to try and not take work seriously. Um, now, I mean, I'm sort of 60 now on the cusp of retirement, and, and I, I kind of always remember one of the reasons I went into doing postgraduate research is I just could not conceive of getting a job. And I look back on the last 35 years, and I kind of said to my wife a while back, geez, how did I get away with that? Um, so the, the, there is a sense of um, just trying to actually st stay semi-detached. But also taking time out. I mean, I've left, I mean, I don't have any kids, so this is why I can't be a model for other people. What that has meant largely is I'm relatively financially secure. And so I've walked out of jobs four or five times now with nothing else really to go to because I just needed the time out. So I, I suppose burnout could have been there if I'd have stuck at it, but it's almost like getting the warning signs or the elder genonic, what's that word? Staff at beer use elder John uh, alerts, but just listen to your body when you're about when you're exhausted, you've got to go, uh, or you've got to take time out. And so, I've traveled around the world for nine months. I a while back did it again, but this time in nine weeks. Um, so it's actually kind of like just taking um, being able to walk away from a very stressful situation. You travel around the world in nine weeks, did I hear Well, that actually, not, not, not quite. Uh, <laughs> um, it was when I um, first set up my company. I was intending to go for 13 weeks, but what I did is I went to Nepal, as, uh, which is my spiritual home, so to speak. Um, then I went to Thailand, and then I went to Malaysia, and I thought of going to China, but then, would you believe, I got bored and um, someone was wanting to <laughs> buy my services already, so I decided to come home. <laughs> The first time in nine months, I didn't quite travel around the world, but I, I did get as far as New Zealand and then came back via India. All right, so, so what, so I mean, it, it, it's, it's quite difficult to pin down what you do. Can you say a few things of, of what you have done? Because you're talking about this adaptability of roles. So, so, so what, what bits and pieces of work have you done that sort of can help us have, a, have a, an idea of, of, of who you are in, in that more holistic multi-cell sense. <laughs> okay, well, as I say, I, I started trying to do postgraduate research. I did it for three and a half years, even did a bit of teaching. So you could say that was the wannabe academic. Um, but I realized that was not gonna, I was never gonna write that. So I sort of drifted, would you believe? It was, it was just accidental. I, I got into local government. Uh, I literally went to the job center one day and just said, you got any jobs? And they basically said, yeah, because the GLC was closing down, you could just go and do some admin work, even without an interview. Uh, they, they then said, uh, you know, apply for the, the job full time. And then I went on a management training course. So I spent eight years, almost eight years in education administration, specifically finance. So I was all about schools, budgets and this kind of stuff. Um, that's when I actually got the chance to take voluntary redundancy. Um, I mean, I hated that job. I absolutely hated it. So, I mean, it, I, it just almost felt toxic. Not because anyone was nasty. It was just because I felt like, say, a saltwater fish in a freshwater pond. It just began to poison me. So when I actually got the 
uh, voluntary redundancy, I then decided I wanted to go around the world. I mean, for me at the time, Australia was like the promised land. Um, but I also was desperate to make sure I didn't come back and get into the same kind of work. So I decided to do a, a master's degree. Well, I was actually thinking originally of actually doing accountancy, but I, I saw this degree in human computer in human computer interaction and technical communication. So I did the MSc when I came back, and then I became a technical author. Now they were I did another eight years as a technical author, which was probably the happiest working time of my life. Um, I've even won awards in that and used to speak at conferences. But I think then because almost because of that, that was uh, you might have heard me in drinking dialogue sometimes say that that had a very, very strong drinking culture. A lot of people were my friends. We'd go out to the pub every night. And that's where we actually sort of would design a lot of the product there. And it was a, a mate, another mate of mine, a salesman, who in talk, you know, being in the pub, I'd be talking about the product, I'd be talking about philosophy, I'd be talking about different ways of looking at things. And he, he'd say, you know, you know more than our consultants. And so he started literally just pimping me out. So he'd say, do you want to go to Edinburgh? But he wouldn't tell my boss. So I'd sort of be almost doing this ad hoc consulting. And in the end, I had to choose. So I choose to go into professional services because I think I'd almost got bored again with, with technical authoring. So I became a consultant for CaseWise. Now CaseWise sold business process modeling tools. So the consultancy is not management consultancy. It was about tool consultancy. You could almost see it as being in knowledge management, to, if anything. It was about how you would set up a business process model to actually be something useful. So I, I kind of did that with CaseWise for three years. Then I left, and I actually did it independently for three for two years, but still using the same tool. Then I went back to CaseWise after the financial crash because all my clients dried up, and they offered me my job back. And then after four years, I left again and did it for two years before BG Group, which was a client I really loved. They got bought by Shell, so contractors were stood down. And that's where a contact invited me to go to a large investment bank. And even though I'm not working for them anymore, I still get paranoid. We're never allowed to mention their name, <laughs> but you can look on LinkedIn and find out. But I was at that large investment bank for about, well, six years. I actually left three weeks ago because, again, I was beginning to feel burnt out, if you like. So uh, there I was a business architect, or that's the label, because everyone likes to have a label, but I didn't do business architecture. I actually felt that I was just a semi-detached contractor providing services. And what were those services? Well, it was modeling. And even within that modeling, uh, with the tool called Enterprise Architect, I was doing something even more niche, if you like, which was meta-model design. And think of meta-model design as the design of the information space. It's an information architecture. And out of that information architecture, that drives the reports, the outputs, the website that comes out of it. So that then makes the model not just a set of process maps no one reads, but it gets them into a set of information that is actionable in the real world. So I see it as kind of knowledge management services. So in that respect, I'm not really a business architect. I think of myself as coming in the field of information sciences, but no one understands what that is. And it's not the same as information theory either, but information sciences is probably my set of capabilities, if you like. Right, so you're an accidental consultant specializing yeah. in, a, in, a, in a, specializing in a science that nobody understands. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Right, that's going to be a really easy interview <laughs> then, isn't it? Um, so, so let's go, let, let's move on to the note you gave us prior, saying, knowing that you're going to talk about Jackson Pollock, uh, evolutionary yep. biology, and jazz. So, um, do, do you want to go with okay Jackson Pollock first? So, from from the notes I've got. Um, Jackson Pollock's paintings, entanglement, uh, entangled yeah. relationships. So, so the, what, what, what do you mean by that? Why are you interested in it? What is it related to, to this, this accidental consulting role that, that you sort of ended up in? Well, I suppose the thing is, is um, I've always seen the world, well, I've always seen the world as complex, but I'm trying to find different words at the moment because I think it's become overused. It's almost become a comfort blanket for a lot of people. But if you actually just think of entangled, now, 
I try to also avoid getting dragged into the quantum stuff because that's, you know, you look at them, that's just heavy duty mathematics and it's related to. I don't know whether you've heard of him, Ted Nelson in the 1950s, somewhat conceptual father of hypertext to a large extent. But he used the word intertwingled. So there is this sense that we are actually in a lot of different contexts at the same time. We are to, well, I came across it through Louis Altazar, the word overdetermined. Now, uh, I, but I think it precedes him, but it's this idea that, for example, we have got, for example, uh, we're in a social um, set of relationships. We're in a political set of relationships. Think of Gramsci and common sense. We are obviously in a built environment and a geographical environment, um, but we've also got our own bodily environment. Uh, I mean, we are ourselves made up of 37 trillion cells, of which about 10% of them are actual foreign bodies, um, you know, viruses and so on. Um, we're, we're, we're actually subject to the limitations of our own body. Um, there is a sense again to, so, so trying to dig in it that way, I think there was a lovely phrase that um, Jeff, Jeff Marlowe, who comes to these sessions, said a while back on LinkedIn. He says, reality acts as a counterpoint to aspiration. And I think it's that kind of sense of limitation, knowing your own limitations could argue, I, I don't know, it's even an ancient Greek idea, isn't it? But knowing your own limitations perhaps gives you that kind of, another phrase, metacognition, self-reflexivity, to start thinking about how you actually live your life for the, you know, for the best, whatever that is, but to actually live your life. So that's just the philosophical interest. Now, I suppose in a sense, I've actually, I wouldn't say I've applied that to my job, but it's informed everything. It's this idea, again, Kenneth Burke, incipient action. You actually have an, an attitude that frames your actions in the world. So I, I've never gone in sort of talking silver bullets or I'm going to transform your life. It's actually always gone in being aware of the fact that we are overdetermined by a multitude of constraints. Uh, it's, um, I mean, you, you've referenced a couple of sort of post-Marxist theorists there as yeah. well. Um, so, so is, 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 I want to say, I don't, I want to, I would, I would regard them as sort of radical humanists rather than yep. the, the, the radical structuralists of the late Marx. Yep. So, yep. is that, is that the, you know, this idea that you can, you can emancipate human life in work and beyond? Is, is that a driving element of what you do? Well, I suppose in a sense, uh, I've become perhaps a bit jaded because the other aspect to that PhD I never wrote was quite literally, it started off as Marxist literary theory. Um, that's my supervisor um, was a Marxist. He was a member of the Communist Party. And I actually think that was part of where I got a bit cognitively dissonance because though my politics have always been to the left, I'm not a Marxist or a revolutionary. And I suppose that's where I actually started going more into the post-Marxism, so like the Frankfurt School and the French structuralists. And of course, the Frankfurt School was all about, you know, uh, praxis and this idea of acting to change the world for the better. And maybe 40 years ago, I genuinely thought that. But now I've become a bit jaded. And that's why I suppose the second part of the thing I want to talk about in the drinking dialogues is, is niche, you know, finding your own niche. I, I think I've long given up this sense of being able to change the world. And of course, just look at politics generally. I mean, in the UK, we have Boris Johnson, who I despise with a passion, but also uh, uh, right across the whole spectrum, a dominant ideology at the moment is right-wing populism. So, you know, there is a sense of kind of feeling as if I've always been on the losing side. <laughs> so let's say my um, objectives are a, lot, a little bit more modest. So, so this this takes us into this evolutionary biology metaphor. Then, so, so you're you're looking at, at constructing a niche, or yep. or not necessarily constructing a niche yourself, but the but but, but niche construction in in organisations yep. and the wider yep. world of work. So, can you can you explain your thinking behind that? Well, I suppose the thing is is that the current job I've just um, finished. I've been there six years now. I've moaned about it all the time. <laughs> And I suppose the thing is, my wife once said, you know, why don't you just leave? Uh, and I thought about it and I thought, well, I myself had found a niche. Um, basically, I was more or less being allowed to get on and just do my own thing. 
um, I was enjoying the technical aspects of work. So there was no real need to leave. I mean, another dimension to this uh, is to, you know, perhaps challenge certain cliches. I was in a comf comfort zone. And I believe once you found a comfort zone, you should stay there. And all this stuff about getting out of this, I think, is just propaganda. I'd actually found my comfort zone. So that's what I wanted to actually stay in. So it's, again, you could say it's very selfish. In fact, it's interesting, some uh, recent <laughs> drinking dialogues, some American guy, ex-military, you know, said quite openly I was utterly selfish. <laughs> um, but I don't really care about that. But the point is, right, is that I had found a niche for me, my comfort zone. But an interesting thing, which I think you're getting at, Richard, is the whole idea of where the companies find their niche. And I don't know whether you've come across Patrick Hooverstad uh, uh, over here in the UK. He's the director of systems and complexity in organizations. And he's big on the viable systems model and all that kind of stuff. But he's written a book called Patterns of Strategy, which is about how companies find their niche in the wider business ecology. Um, and it's founded on ideas, um, I think it's a Humberto Maturano with structural coupling. So in a sense, in the same way, perhaps as a virus can structurally couple with its host, so can a company structurally couple with its environment in a wider economic uh, ecosystem. Um, and I think, uh, again, it's this idea, perhaps always not trying to overreach, not trying to do more than what your core it's, I don't really like the word purpose for some reason. I don't know why, but what your core purpose is. So my core purpose has always been to minimize hassle and stress. So that's where my kind of niche is coming from. The, uh, the, the, the thing that you mentioned a few times, uh, Malcolm, was uh, trying to find your niche. What, 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 what drives you to in finding that niche uh, instead of being more like, so you could be generalist as well, right? But um, for some some reason, you I, chose to find I think a what it specific is, area. I, I think what it is, right, is it's whether one wants to call it comfort or even some kind of, I'd say ecstasy. That's, I only say that because only last night I was watching a documentary about Dionysus. Dionysius, I know Richard's into Dionysius. But it's like uh, th this documentary is about the social aspects of Dionysus in, in Greek history. So the actual idea of transforming yourself through wine and dance and so on, you know, it does seem to be a very strong human urge. Now, one thing that I found is I can get totally into the zone. I mean, I can't rarely function in the mornings. I mean, it's interesting you asked earlier about am I a morning or a uh, night person? I get up early, but I cannot concentrate until I've had my lunch. And but I'll, I'll take lunch at 11.30 or 12, and sometimes I can work from one till six without a break and not even be aware of what's going on. It's totally absorbing and transformational. Um, and, you know, my backdrop, Nepal, the same thing happens with high altitude um, trekking. So two completely almost different situations have a common theme of feeling, is it comfortable or transformed? I almost see the two as being just two sides of the same thing. Um, so the niche idea is just being able to do what pleases me. But you can look at it another way because it is this idea that when I'm in my niche in work, it's usually because a manager has emphasized my strengths rather than the nonsense of trying to work on my weaknesses. So, it, it, you know, in a sense, when you fresh out of college, yes, you might want to be an all-rounder. You're still finding your way, what you're good at, what you're bad at. So you do want to actually do lots of different things. But, you know, when you sort of get into your 40s or 50s, you know where you're going. And I think it's all about maximizing your strengths. And I can really get into the zone. I mean, it, you know, sometimes I can remember, you know, Doing, I, I used to hate doing training courses, but I can always, so I've got this like, you know, vivid memories of doing a training course in Edinburgh where it'd gone really, really well. And I'm on the plane back to London. It's only an hour's flight. And I'm so high as a kite that I'd sort of like drink three glasses of wine in that one hour flight. It, it's, it's that kind of um, really just being able to feel, for want of a better word, fulfilled. I'm, I'm going to. I want to push this metaphor a bit further, Malcolm, because you're talking yeah. you're talking about niches. So you're you're, you're, you're the hassle-free niche that you've mm. 
sort of found and created yourself. Mm. But you seem to have had four or five very different ones. Yes, yes, so, indeed. So, so is there, so, so to push the evolutionary biology metaphor further, I mean, is, is there also this drive to adapt? Yes, yes, absolutely. That's fundamental. That is actually fundamental. Because the really interesting thing is, if you do a quick Google search about finding your niche, you find all these, you know, twee motivational posters type stuff. But the reason I wanted to use evolutionary biology is it's fundamentally this idea of adaption that the classic one is a beaver. So the beavers will build. So it's niche construction. This is the thing I'm talking finding my niche, but in evolutionary biology is actually called niche construction. So it's where animals will use affordances in the environment. So just leave as they can find to engineer something that is beneficial to them. That then has a feedback loop, selection pressure to reinforce the fit to that um, niche. But of course, one of the things in these articles I was reading says is that the ultimate in niche construction is to migrate somewhere completely different. It, it gives you perhaps another perspective on so-called invasive species. Invasive species is an economic issue or a social economic issue in biology. It doesn't care that the, the organism will go and find the niche best suited to it. So, you know, the ultimate niche construction is to change your niche, is to change your environment altogether. But you're right, Richard, it's fundamentally about adaptation. It's fundamentally about finding what's in the environment you can use to your benefit. And when it's no longer available, it's actually perhaps as humans, we can change it or evolving and just find, yeah, you know, I mean, another way I, I think about this sometimes is I think my working career has been very opportunistic. Now, I think this is interesting because the word, at least in the UK, to call someone an opportunist is to actually be criticizing them or morally, you know, sort of, you know, saying you're somehow lacking in morality. But I'd say nearly everything I've done has been opportunistic. Uh, I've never had some grand idea. An opportunity suddenly arose and I thought, yeah, yeah, the time to go, time to take that. So now that you're sort of almost a, a tinkerer, because I've done some yeah. work and, and some research on the notion of tinkering and, and the value yeah. of tinkering in, in organisations. Yeah. So with that, with that resonation, and again, you know, could, I, could you, you illustrate it? No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the last few years at this bank, uh, I mean, it was actually really great. Um, I don't really know how it rose because, uh, again, it's full of contradictions. My immediate boss, I think, is very much, if you think of the conniving framework that, and whether I've said it right, he's very much rooted in the bottom right. It's all about order. But I think with a great leap of faith with him, about four years ago, I was Google-like, given every Friday off to just go and do my own experimentation. Now, it was geared towards solving a particular problem that was not just technical, it was also political, because basically the product owners said this particular software couldn't do stuff, and I was pretty damn sure it could. Uh, so I was given this kind of like, about three or four months every Friday to go and do all this. So I really built up a lot of capability. Um, but then that sort of evolved into doing a lot of proof of concept work. And this is exactly the case. I, I was saying it only to my wife last night. Um, when I actually have solved a problem or proved a concept in my own mind, I am totally bored with it. I wanna move on to something else. I wanna hand it over for somebody else to take forward. And if that taking forward means killing it, I'm, I'm not the slightest bothered. It's this idea of letting go. So um, the, the tinkering, you're absolutely right on. I mean, uh, I think, you know, somebody once said, I'm not a finisher. Um, and I'm not, I'm not someone who can actually just do this kind of routine work. I don't actually feel possessive about the work. And again, as a consultant, you know, some of my assignments, because it was tool-based, might only be a day. Some lasted four years. But the, the sense of, you know, somebody once said to me, doesn't it bother you um, that you'd never get to see what they've done with the product? And it sort of didn't. So I am sort of tinkering uh, a lot of the time. I, I, I'm not sure tinkering is the right word, but I, I accept the profile, you know, the, the kind of like the stereotype. It is the fact that I like to just sort of almost prove the point and move on. 
it also resonates a little bit with the, the, the notion of the neo-generalists. So, so Kenneth Middleton and Richard Martin's work, where they talk about being both being a specialist and a generalist at the same time. So, so yeah. you've you've sort of got four or five specialities that you you've become exceptionally good at over the years, but you've got this generalistic understanding. Yeah. And and so so Kenneth and, and Richard talk about this being the future. Okay, that, that neo-generalism yeah. is, is the future of leadership. So my but at the same time, you're looking at so many organisations only wanting vertical specialisms and not yeah, actually. Absolutely. So, absolutely. I, so, so, were you valued for this this kind of way of being? And a more difficult question: Will the upcoming generation have the opportunity to develop like that? First one, I think I have been valued over the years, but interestingly, maybe not um, by the usual suspects. I've always felt to a large extent, well, certainly in CaseWise, let's take CaseWise, I was employed by CaseWise for about nine years, four years, longer, four years as a technical author, and then a three-year and a four-year stint as a consultant. And I nearly always felt as if I was clashing with my bosses, but the salesman really valued what I was doing, and so did the clients. And I think there is this sense of like, um, uh, you know, it often happens, I think, to consultants. It's a kind of known thing. You kind of go native. I started actually, I felt, representing the interests of the client more than the, the employer. But because I was bringing in so much money, one of my biggest allies was the director of finance. Um, so I think in that respect, I was valued there. Um, and I think I was, it's like, go back to that client of um, BG when he said, you know, what kind of, you know, why are you different from normal consultants? And I said, well, I do jazz consulting. I think it's also because I was applying this kind of what you might call multidisciplinary approach. Um, your second question, and one interesting thing, because it, it goes into the second question, I think modern people are not getting this benefit because for me, where this all starts was Lancaster University, where I did my first degree. Now, I just feel this is a, an example of pure luck. I never really chose to go to Lancaster I, I just seemed like I don't know half best thing to do um, but it actually had an interdisciplinary approach I mean I went to do English but in your first year you had to do basically three subjects two modules in each um, and in the English I was only allowed to do one of literature you had the compulsory one on linguistics and then you had these four other modules so I did comparative religious studies and philosophy um, so that's what, how you did your foundation year. But then when I went into the uh, second and third year, there was real encouragement to cross fertilize. So I can actually remember in my third year doing um, a double weighted essay, because you could choose whether to do two 4,000 word essays or a single 7,000 word essay. And I chose the latter on romantic literature. And I hardly spoke about romantic literature. I, I kind of start, well, I started with romantic literature and then started seeing it's uh, the whole romantic sensibility through the late 19th century, where it all began to go wrong with, you know, Ibsen and, and um, Strindberg and how you sort of got this increasing degree of existential angst and how you've got the foundations almost of Nazism with this kind of disillusioned romanticism and coming eventually into existentialism. Uh, and I, I, a lot of the underlying theory was all the stuff I'd learned from my anthropology. And this was really valued. I mean, the, the, the lecturer was wowed by it. Um, and I think that was just, was it pure luck uh, that I just had those lecturers or was that official policy? For me, that was what university was about. So that was normal. And then when I left Lancaster and started going into the big wide world and that, meeting people from other universities, they said they didn't really have that experience. And now I think there's no way you've got that experience. I mean, you look on university websites and it's all about we are multidisciplinary, but then you start talking to lecturers and say, it's not because of things like the research excellence framework and you've got to get so many things published. It militates against this, if you like, speculative exploration. So I, I do actually think, unfortunately, I think this is a very profound point because I actually think that kind of interdisciplinary approach or transdisciplinary approach is going to be fundamental for the future. And it's not there. I mean, there, there, there's interestingly, because <clears throat> I've been reading a lot of stuff on the history of cybernetics recently, a brilliant um, idea from Buckminster Fuller, 
Um, and he talked about the comprehensive designer, uh, which he described as an emerging synthesis of artist, inventor, mechanic, objective and economist, uh, economist and evolutionary strategist. And I mean, just nice words, but this idea of having to be lots of different things. And of course, no one person can do all that. So that's where your collaboration comes in. Uh, I, I, the fact that you've got to collaborate cross-disciplinary. So here's another thing as well. Why did I never seem to get on with my peers when I was a consultant? But I absolutely got on really well with the help desk, the programmers and the salespeople. It's almost as if I instinctively you know, needed to go and um, uh, cro uh, cross fertilize, as it were, or be multidisciplinary. But yeah, you, Richard, you're absolutely right. I think that is the challenge for the future about having this multidisciplinary approach. It's almost anti tribal. Because yes, you're saying, yeah. like, like I, I, I'm because there's so much work at the moment in, in neuroscience around why we tribe together. Yeah. But you're sort of saying, like, I, whatever role I had, I, 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 I tried to, to not tribe with them. Yes, yeah. Uh, it's probably now this is again uh, I mean it's interesting this is it just me I mean this is interesting because I've always felt like a bit of an outsider um, and it, I think there's there's two points to this again it's like a feedback loop isn't that I've read a brilliant book about four years ago saying the problem with outsiders is they actually want to be inside um, but also maybe because you perhaps feel excluded you then for the whole sense of your sense of comfort, psychological safety, start making a big thing of it. So you actually play to the role of being an outsider. So that might be something that has kind of evolved over the years as well. And of course, you know, there's certain cultural things. I was born in Liverpool and just the actual uh, history of Liverpool, the social history of Liverpool is it's a very, very, what you might call separatist kind of city. I mean, the joke is, is that Liverpool is the capital of Ireland and it's the capital of Wales because <laughs> it's a, it's very much put, uh, full of, you know, on this Celtic fringe because of its relationship with the sea. I mean, my father was a seaman. A lot of my relatives were related to the sea. You've got this sense that it always looked uh, west to, to, to the Americas rather than inward to, to the UK. So again, uh, one's so so here's a, another contradiction i mean my anti-tribalism you could say is actually rooted in the tribalism of liverpool <laughs> but which which kind of itself has a very oppositional um separatist kind of uh, feel to it is this something that you really uh, played with as well malcolm sort of being the inside or outsider because your works actually throughout your career you've been kind of consulted, right, over the last, especially the last few years. Um, is this something that you consciously sort of developed? It, it's difficult to say. Um, it, it, it's, it's this idea of the feedback loop, and it's this metaphor from evolutionary uh, uh, biological evolution. You sort of, um, you find that the situation supports it, and so you capitalize on it, and that you get like a reinforcing loop. So this is why I often say that most of my life, you know, has been luck. I mean, I've read something recently. It says that, you know, a lot of people's achievements is probably more rooted in luck than talent. <laughs> um, so it's almost just as if I've been opportunistic or played upon the situation as presented to me. I often try to think of counterfactuals. I mean, you know, when I, why did I go to Lancaster and not Kiel? Um, I remember when I came to London to do my PhD, I actually didn't even want to. And I think psychologically I didn't want to because I actually put in the application not for a PhD. I didn't think I was good enough. I wanted to do, go and do an MA at Southampton. Um, but I'd forgotten to sign the form, would you believe? So what was going on subconsciously? But my lecturers at Lancaster, because in those days you had to go through your first university, she rang me up and said, you're being a fool. I can get you the grant. Um, so I'm not going to fill in this form. I'm not going to send it you back. Uh, I want you to fill it in again for the PhD. So I got completely sort of, um, you know, flattered by this. So I ended up going to Goldsmiths. But what would have happened if I'd gone to 
uh, Southampton. So there's so many of these little kind of like sliding doors events where who knows how my life would have been different. But the way it's actually just panned out has always been this kind of food feedback loop with the situation. Well, I think, I mean, I can understand why you sort of, you've become attracted to the kind of stuff we do, because I say you're filling the role of, I mean, Janice Klein calls it the outsider insider. Oh, right, um, okay. There's there's another thing, the principled infidel, right, uh, right. or the tempered radical. And, yeah. and the language I use, of course, is, is yeah. the, the organisational ironist, the person that's yeah. both of and not of the organisation yeah. and yeah. works hard in, in the gaps that nobody else sees. So that it all seems to define what, what you're talking about. And this, this will sort of take us into your last theme, I think, and, and it's the, the jazz theme. So this is where, you know, the, the idea of being exceptionally good at, 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 at an instrument mm. and, and, and an exceptionally good as working with a, a, a group of other people exceptionally good at instruments. Mm. So you can all do the bass, the, the, play the tune, do the, the, do the basics, mm. etc. But then you can all go off on these incredible tangents and do things yeah. that nobody was expecting. So is that sort of the love of jazz? And then is, that, is that a metaphor of, of what you've always tried to do? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it, it's uh, it's like there's. I think there's um, there's also several things about jazz. I mean, uh, in the drinking dialogues, I'm probably actually going to do a clip from Miles Davis because I think there's a fascinating thing. It's when he did the soundtrack to Louis Malle's film *Lift to the Scaffold*. Now, to cut a long story short, he basically improvised it in one take. But what he was doing there, you see, is that he'd already spoken to Louis Malle. Louis Mallard set out his vision of what he wanted. Miles Davis went and got together an ad hoc collection of French session musicians, told them what he had in mind, and then improvised this. And that just sort of struck me as like the consulting I kind of used to do. It's almost like conversational co-creation, almost sounds a bit like agile. Um, so there's that respect of actually um, improvisation to achieve some kind of solution. The other clip I was thinking of playing, but I think the the, the uh, Miles Davis one works better, is it, a band called Moray Music. Now, Moray itself is really, really evocative because Moray is tightly woven, very complex silk. So he's using deliberately the metaphor of that. Now, I saw them in the mid 80s um, and they're a 12 piece band. Now, the way, and I've also got a live album. And when you listen to it, you can really see how there is some sense of self-direction there. I mean, Trevor Watts was the band leader, but he's just one of four saxophone players. He's not in any real sense of the word leading that band. They are actually doing what you might call mid-course corrections as they go along and keep on, though they'll sometimes go off piste a bit, they always comes back to a certain, they'll discover a melody, they'll discover a purpose. And, and I think that sense there, if you think of, uh, I want to use the phrase, the society of the self. So I almost think of myself as a jazz band with all these competing drives in there, just constantly correcting. And as it begins to fall apart, you bring it back together again. Uh, and then I suppose another third aspect of jazz is certainly in literature, it is always associated with resistance and personal autonomy. Um, so again, I think they're the kind of themes you've got, you've got there with, with, with jazz. I think also you've got other aspects to this is um, not necessarily jazz, but just music. Well, first of all, I think improvisation doesn't just mean, it isn't just with jazz as well. I mean, I, I came across some, I don't know whether you've ever been to Bali and seen the Balinese dance with the Gamelan Orchestra. They're using improvisation. Uh, or in Indian classical music, you've got something called raga or raga, which again uses a kind of improvisation. Um, so I think this kind of like urge to improvise is, is kind of fundamental to all of us, but I, perhaps what I've tried to do is foreground it, cultivate it. Um, I went a bit, I, I think I lost my way a bit there. I think you asked a slightly different question. So there you go, there's jazz for you, <laughs> going off on a complete tangent. I mean, the, I think the, the urge to improvise, I'm going to come back to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's so, so Stuart Clegg, who, who's the father of critical management studies, writes a lot on jazz and was a great jazz listener. So, mm. so there's something, there's something in this critical appreciation of, of, of management, which you obviously have with your, your sort of radical 
structural magical humanist um, references as well. I mean, so is it is it sort of a soft critique of management that's been driving you? You know, part of it and not of it. And... Yeah, I, I think it probably is. Um, I think there is just a sense um, of of critique. Uh, I think there is this idea of always needing, if you like, again, a musical metaphor, you need a counterpoint, you need to be able to actually, um, uh, I suppose, provide different perspectives. I mean, one thing I think I'm good at, and maybe it comes from my philosophy training, is um, I think I'm very good at seeing problems and seeing things that I know just won't work. But I don't think I'm actually so good at building a solution. So you can see where this is going. One of, for me, the most stupid things I've ever come across in my life is this phrase you get now, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. Well, if I had the solution, I wouldn't even be talking to you. But what it is, what I'm trying to do is basically say, look, here is an alert. I just think that I just know this isn't going to work. Or have you seen this problem? Have you seen that problem? Have you seen this problem? That's not meant to undermine management. That's actually meant to try and be as a critique. And, and I think there's a really interesting thing about this. Um, I know one of the salesmen really picked up on this about 10 years ago or 15 years ago. I, I was, I think, um, going through a certain phase when I was with CaseWise where I constantly was kind of moti moaning, if you like, or criticizing people. And, and, and a, a salesman kind of like said, it's only actually Malcolm because you actually give a damn. Um, most people don't, they just get their head down or they're looking for another job. Whereas the fact that you're moaning about it is because you actually want to improve things. So it's almost like, you know, when people talk about continuous improvement, I don't think you can have improvement without critique and also without a certain bit of destruction as well. Uh, I, it's interesting, I just listened to a Bruce Daisley podcast uh, a, a few days ago and he was saying exactly the same thing about his first job. He, the, the, the big boss used to walk around and uh, looking for people who would critique. And then he was the one that would always put his head up above the parapet and, and the other people, this, this is interesting, this is what I want to ask you. And he said he would put his head up above the parapet and would ask spiky questions. Mm. And everyone else in the organization would distance themselves from him yeah. when the boss, because they didn't want to be caught and be yeah. seen part of the ripples that were coming off him. I mean, yeah. is, is that another thing that you resonate with you? Is that you, yeah, when you were the spiky one, everyone else yeah. was like, oh, it's Malcolm doing Malcolm's thing. Yes, there, there, there was an element of that. I mean, I remember once we were about 20 of us in the company all went to um, Dublin or somewhere. I think it was Dublin to, to have some away day. And I was actually the most junior person there. And, you know, I, I, I think weirdly, maybe because I was the most junior one there, I was probably the most outspokenly critical. And the really weird thing is almost like I think it surprised so many people because so many people were terrified of the CEO. But that CEO, I think, really took a liking to me because, you know, he um, maybe it's because I was the only one to stand up to him. Um, maybe, I, I don't know, it was just really quite an interesting situation. And then I suppose as a consultant, this is another interesting point. You have certain permissions or powers inherent in the role. So people are almost half expecting it. So I would be able to say to clients things that maybe no one else would say there because actually at the end of the day, I might be gone tomorrow, certainly gone within a few weeks. So there was a kind of a permission there as well. The, um, the one thing that strikes me, uh, Malcolm, that, that you the way you, you, you tell your stories, right? You seem like a very fearless person um, <laughs> that, that really embraces uncertainty, <laughs> which is also maybe part of, of that jazz as well, right? Because uh, it's you just jump into the deep because you don't know what's going to happen in your improvise. Um, but, uh, yeah, you also mentioned that there is a lot of um, paradoxes where you kind of also try to, not, not to find an easy way, out but um you, you you like to find the comfortable spot right mm -hmm. to, to go with the flow mm -hmm. and it's it to me that's very intriguing how you kind of have navigated your sort of career through that um uh, as you said some people say you're an opportunist opportunist mm -hmm. um but yeah it's 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 quite extreme how you've kind of 
is it next week? It, it's yeah. It's... Well, no, I, th I think it's interesting, and I, th I think there's also don't forget there's probably a little bit of performance here. Go back to the beginning about chameleon. I mean, I'm not really, you know, the, the, this is one performance today, to so to speak. I mean, it, it could have gone a different way. You ask me the questions next week, I might be slightly nuanced differently. But the, I think this idea, the contradiction perhaps between the fearlessness and the comfort. I mean, a, a quote from T.S. Eliot I love saying is, the awful daring of a moment's surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract. Now, it's like a great leap of faith. It, is it Kierkegaard or Heidegger does the great leap of faith? Now, that's often what I felt that I did, certainly in 1993, when I left my local government job. I did this great leap of faith. There was a recession on in the UK at the time. I was 32 years of age. Um, everyone thought I was crazy. But because the job itself had begun to feel poisonous, I was well within my comfort zone in taking that leap of faith, just like I was well within my comfort zone when I did a bungee jump and a parachute jump. There are all leaps of faith, but I was still within my comfort zone. So I actually think what you're looking at here is possibly just the idea of agency and control in each of those. You see, in local government, I was losing control of the situation. By leaving, I regained it. And, and I think that's where perhaps the apparent contradiction lies, is that I have the agency. Um, the idea about the performativeness when I said, you see, I love making that quote because it makes me out to be uh, very brave and courageous, but am I really? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, How about you, Richard? Have you got a point <laughs> to change yet? Uh, I mean, I, no, I mean, I, the, the, idea, the idea of performing, performing on stage or performing mm. because you're a part of an interview, I mean, that, anyone who's ever been to a job interview, mm. I mean, that, that's not you. That's a performance of you. Yeah. Uh, because you're trying to get a job and it's a very unusual stage mm. to be on and, mm. and, and being interviewed on a, a podcast stroke webinar is also a very unusual yeah. stage to be on so mm. so there's always a performative aspect the the, the, the thing i find interesting is always is, is how much of uh, how reflective enough are you and aware enough are you to sort of all of what your existence has this performative aspects to mm. it and, and you, you're always doing it and, and you can do it differently, badly, well, but, but, but it's the awareness that's important. Mm. And it might, yeah. it's, it, it can't be ever present. That's impossible. But it, it can arise at times. Well, I think there's an interesting thing on this. I, I know you're interested in neuroscience, Richard, but have you come across um, the whole thing with metacognition? Now, and I, I, was, I get new scientists every week. And in, actually in this week's new scientists, they've sort of picked up on it. And a guy called Peter Fleming, I think it is. He's a new yeah, Mark, my Peter Fleming, no, no, different Peter Fleming. One of Peter, Peter Fleming March, my PhD, March, my PhD, but uh, he wasn't a neuroscientist. It, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I got the first name right, but I think the second name is Fleming, um, and he's, a, I think, he's a neuroscientist at UCL. But he's talking about metacognitive functions now, not just being, uh, uh, you know, about being critical, but uh, about being self-critical, but is actually all functions in the brain. So when you perhaps have things like dementia, it's where those functions begin to get eroded or degraded. But I think it's about if there are stuff that you can learn, uh, you, like any kind of brain functions, you can sort of big them up. But it is this idea about how he says it's, um, it doesn't have to be at some great genius level. He says, even when you're revising for an exam, you know, just when you say, I haven't done enough revision in this subject, that is a metacognitive function because you're thinking about the thinking, you're making a judgment about your effectiveness, you're making a judgment about your belief and how much you know. And I think that this kind of like metacognitive thing is, I felt I got it for free at Lancaster all those years ago. Um, but I do feel as if a lot of education is, uh, as we were talking about earlier, is almost downgrading that. I mean, you may or may not have heard or may not care. But in the UK, apparently, you know, history is going to be slashed in universities or funding for history is going to be slashed. And I think it's through history that you can get a lot of self-reflexivity in like looking at the causes of various stuff. Um, so uh, again, I, I think being able to have that metacognitive functioning also just gives you more flexibility, more ability to pivot. Now, whether that is performative or whatever, I just think it gives you that sense of more variability, if you like. I mean, again, in systems thinking, you've got Ashby's idea of requisite variety. 
if you've got more variety, more capability, then you've got more chance of, I think, reacting to a situation. And that's, I think, one of the key points, for example, about our jazz artists. They're not just making it up. They've got a whole repertoire of licks and motives and themes, which they just recombine. And I think in that respect, that's where you've got um, the idea of a metacognitive function that is a bit like jazz, which is self-reflexivity, which gives you more ability to react to whatever life throws at you. Wonderful. I mean, it takes us to the last question, which is going to be a tough one. I don't quite know how I'm going to ask you, but I'll do my best. So we always call it the, the, the nine trillion dollar question, the yeah. idea of lost value creation um, because of, of, of ineff inefficiency and outdated organizational functions and, and Brexit. So the way, I'm, the way you sort of describe yourself, and I think we've got to a point where we, we can sort of make a claim that you're, 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 you're sort of metacognitive, cognitive. <laughs> you have metacognition, you, you're a soft critic, you, <laughs> you have an, a, an urge to improvise, uh, and, and, and an adaptive sort of tinkerer that, that, that floats mm. around. So, so and, and my question is, if that kind of person gets more opportunities in contemporary organizations, what kind of value do you think could be realized? I think it gives the organization possibly what you might say more resilience, because I think a lot of organizations, possibly the larger they get, almost, all, I'm, I'm using uh, channeling Snowden's ideas recently on robustness and resilience. So a lot of organizations, as they get bigger, become more and more robust in their internal controls, in their procedures, in their operating procedures and all this. But I think a lot of them probably lack a certain degree of resilience. And I think it's this idea of being able to have enough in the re repertoire, if you like, enough of a bag of tricks to be resilient, to be able to pivot, to be able to actually um, just respond quickly. Uh, so yeah, that's probably what I'd say gives the value. Thank you. So, Malcolm, there was a fascinating <laughs> free flow interview um, <laughs> today. Um, Richard, as well, thanks a lot for another wonderful uh, co hosting session, and I'll see you next time. Yep. See you, Japs. Bye now.